In the last module for this lecture, we'll look at some alternatives to CSP and some extensions to this algorithm. Um, importantly, what's pretty nice about common spatial patterns is it gives you um, useful features. You know, it gives you the most informative spatial filter you know, for, for one class and, uh, you know, with maximum variance, and it gives you another one for the other class. And so with just two features that come out of this, log variance, you, you are very well underway. And you can maybe take a couple more features, include a few more eigenvectors, um, to work with. And so you have a low dimensional space. And that means just about every classifier that has ever been invented works well with this data. A linear discriminant analysis, quadratic discriminant analysis, and so on. It's statistically well distributed. So it's Gaussian, basically, approximately, after the log transform and so on. And so um, some other classifiers that people are using are not a linear separating hyperplane between the two trial distributions in feature space now. We're back to you know the, the plot where we had LDA and the hyperplane here. Um, and these are now trials. And these are features. Um, but instead, some kind of a quadratic surface, for example. Which, uh, which, which is the right thing to do if, say, one distribution is different from the other distribution in terms of shape. The only trouble with that method is that you know, it's sort of prone to outliers because it assumes Gaussianity. It is actually not an outlier. Um, and uh, because of that, it's, it's basically much less rigidly defined as LDA. You know, LDA says, this is a plane, and it's never going to change. Whereas, uh, and an outlier is not going to destroy that as much. But um, QDA is um, much, much easier to, to destroy, basically, even though it's more expressive. You can use Gaussian mixture models, which basically fit Gaussian distributions to, say, multiple blobs in one class. And that's particularly relevant if you have a condition that actually consists of subconditions. Like, say, a person is making an error, and there are three kinds of errors. You know, whatever, he presses this button incorrectly, and he does that incorrectly and that. That's probably three different distributions for one class. And you, you, you need to somehow characterize those. And so GMMs are not too bad for that. The only issue is that uh, they usually also, you know, in practice, they, for EG especially, they usually don't work that well. <laughs> uh, in, you know, usually you have too high dimensional data. In the case of CSP, it's not quite as bad. You usually have outliers, and these are easy to break with outliers as well. And um, you typically don't have enough observations. You just have a couple of trials and so on. But still, it's a fancy method that you can easily throw at the data. And it's, of course, also in the toolbox. There is a few other issues in that, that that's, there isn't really a um, well-understood algorithm that fits these things optimally. You know, There's a bunch of them that optimize something incrementally, but it can be local optima or things like that. And also, it's usually not clear in advance how many Gaussians you wanted to fit, unless you know how many subconditions you had. Uh, so you, although there's methods for that, there's variational Bayesian, there's late process Gaussian mixture models if you want to put in a lot of mumbo jumbo into your paper, <laughs> um, technical <laughs> mumbo jumbo. Uh, so there's methods to do this as well. So that would be another alternative. And the third al big alternative, classifier, is those which directly optimize the location of you know, the hyperplane or the parameters of the mapping from, from data space to or feature space to label. And we'll discuss these at greater length because they're very, very powerful um, methods that also work in large scale situations. So these things don't try to don't even try to characterize the data and the distribution of the data. They just directly optimize um, the uh, parameters of the classifier. Talking again, uh, moving back from the classifier back to the, sp to the spatial filters, why CSP is very good, um, there's, there's lots of extensions of this. So there are some extensions which learn automatically the frequency bands that are relevant. There's others which can deal with multiple known frequency bands and so on, such as filter bank CSP. And there are some which are regularized in some way. So they give you better behaved results if you had too little data or if you had outliers or things like that. And there's probably, as I said, there's on the order of 50 or so versions of this method. And many of them are actually uh, implemented. And frequently, it's about just getting rid of the heuristics, you know, what's the right frequency window or right time window and so on, and solving that as part of the problem. 
So um, here's, here's one method. I'm going to just skip quickly over this, which is called spectrally weighted common spatial patterns. It sort of does CSP on some a priori assumed frequency band, and then it calculates basically the correlation coefficient between um, you know, the label and, and the two class distribution. So we say the spectrum under one condition, spectrum under the other condition. And um, you know, there are some frequencies where it's more informative and others where it's less informative. And it directly turns that into a, into a frequency weighting. And so it learns things like this. And after you've calculated this, you can take this frequency filter and do another iteration and optimize the spatial filters again. And so it's basically alternating uh, in alternation optimizing frequency filters and spatial filters. That's also a case of uh, block coordinate descent, actually, for optimization freaks. So that's called spectrally weighted CSP. And it's pretty good. It's usually better than CSP. But um, it, there's no guarantee that it finds some kind of global optimum or so. Um, here's, here's a prediction function for this. So if you have adapted or learned um, frequency weights, you can basically have a somewhat more complex prediction function, which looks just like the one that we just said, except there's another matrix here, t. And t is a temporal linear transform. It's applied, you know, excess, you know, it's time by channels. Spatial filter is on the channel side. Temporal filter is on the time side, basically. And so here you can implement FIR filters and things like that, or an FFT weighting and IFFT. It's not necessarily very efficient to write it like that, just like I said in, in one of the very first lectures. But it's a, a very, very general um, functional form, and it allows you to cover just about any stationary oscillatory process quite well. And there's different methods to optimize the T, and SpecCSP is one of them. Talking about these regularized variants, I think this is sort of one of the last slides. If you have very pathological data, such as you have way too few trials to learn any parameters, or there's lots of garbage happening in your recordings, CSP can actually fail quite spectacularly. So this is, looks like a spatial filter, right? Uh, OK, now this doesn't look like a spatial filter at all. It's basically you know, garbage, 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 garbage. And so there's a bunch of alternatives that apply various kinds of regularization, similar to how it is done in shrinkage LDA, uh, under different assumptions and so on, which constrain the solution space in a reasonable manner. And so all of these actually get you reasonable solutions for the same data, you know, reasonable here, reasonable here, reasonable, et cetera. Not sure about that one. So these things all have a regularization parameter that is optimized using cross validation. And they are also in the toolbox, so um, quite useful if you have the time to calculate that. These data come from BCI competition, by the way. And the last thing to say here is that some of the so CSP by itself is, if you look from it up from the book, it's defined for two classes, you know, class one, class two, and do some joint diagonalization of covariance matrices and so on. You can generalize it to multiple classes just using voting, basically, uh, you know, uh, just like in machine learning. So you uh, you uh, predict class 1 versus B, uh, oh, sorry, 1 versus 2, class 2 versus 3, 3 versus 4, and assign scores, and then see which class gets the most scores, uh, for example. So you can do 1 versus rest, 1 versus all, and so on. So um, that's this. And um, when you're doing voting, <laughs> it, let's say it works best if your classifiers actually produce continuous outputs or probabilities or so, um, such as logistic regression. Last but not least, um, the time windows, it's an ugly heuristic, but it works actually pretty well. So when you look at this data here, it's really clear where the oscillation starts and where it ends. Uh, and you can easily have some kind of a search where you find kind of the onset and the offset of this. And in fact, most of the actual, let's say some of the actual production BCI, such as Berlin Brain Computer Interface, primarily rely on some heuristics to find these things. But if you are looking at something else than these stationary oscillations, something where you don't really know what to expect or where you have multiple blobs and different frequencies, there these heuristics don't get you very far. There you need a method that can learn multiple 
frequency bands, multiple time windows, and so on, all at the same time. And that's where some of the more advanced methods come into play, like RSSD. And that's uh, the end of this module for today.